a waste because that's part of your cost of doing business. So the most important case in this area occurred in California, and the Californians <coughs> actually did enact a law which protected them from further power plant construction until such time as the federal government had a facility to dispose of the waste. Because then you can do the calculations. We imitated that law in Illinois. It went on the books in 1997. And that's been the single barrier that has protected Illinois from getting more nuclear reactors and consequently more radioactive waste. There have been four attempts in the last five years to repeal that law, either in whole or in part. And we just need the most recent one back last week. So this is a state authority, and it saved our bacon sense of radioactive waste in a kind of circuitous way. The last uh, important uh, area of jurisdiction is sort of a hybrid sharing relationship uh, called agreement state status. And what this meant was that the Federal Nuclear Regulatory Commission was willing to cede certain authorities to the states on certain issues dealing with uh, nuclear power. They were not going to give up their authority on safety, but they would give up authority on uh, the management, let's say, of medical isotopes, uh, research reactor isotopes, and low-level radioactive waste, not the hot spent fuel rods, but the contaminated trash and things from the power plants. So they worked out these agreements, and what it really means is that the state submits an application to the federal government to become an agreement state. They promulgate a whole series of regulations which are pretty much in parallel with what exists at the federal level and agree that they will operate their business in the state the same way the NRC would have if they would have if NRC would have got the authority. So we do have that in Illinois. I think there's 30 some states around the country that are agreement states. So they do have some jurisdictional authority on very select radiation issues. However, safety at nuclear reactors is not one of them. So, so that's the, the final uh, area of jurisdiction that I wanted to talk about tonight in terms of where can you play? Where can you intervene as citizens? Where can the public uh, participate in this process and the power? Let me just stop there and see if anyone is really confused. Okay, cool. So, what's going on? I didn't make a slide because when you try to put something like this on a slide, I don't care what row you're sitting in, you're not going to be able to read it anyway. So, I just wanted to give you a flavor of what's going on in nuclear land. And you can contrast that to the fact that there are 23 or 24 people in this room tonight on Earth Day 43. It, it will show kind of the mismatch between is this an environmental issue or not and people's perception of what's going on. So this is just since January of this year. And most of this is Illinois based. This is not all federal. So in January 13th of this year, a investigative reporter from a Japanese newspaper, the English speaking version, released his investigative report about the Byron nuclear power station he had been working on for a year and a half. And uh, his allegations are pretty astonishing because uh, the bottom line on some of it is that while the Byron station was being portrayed to the world as the model reactor in the Exelon fleet, um, a lot of things were rotten in Denmark. And uh, some of the issues in the story that he reported is that the work situation was so bad that the intimidation was so strong, that whistleblowing uh, on safety matters was so, not just discouraged, but aggressively beaten into the ground, that it resulted allegedly in the suicides of three reactor operators. Now, that's a pretty strong allegation. And all I can tell you is that at the present time, those allegations have been forwarded to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the Region 3 Director here in Illinois has forwarded it on to the Office of the Inspector General of the NRC for investigation. Was there any publicity in that? In press? Anybody hear about it? Uh, well, I think that's why I asked in Chicago papers. And that's the interesting question. I've, I've submitted that even to some of my reporter friends in Chicago. 
why does it take the English language version of a Japanese newspaper to break the story about the Byron nuclear plant and the turf of the Chicago Tribune? You don't have to answer that. No, Chicago Tribune hasn't touched it. Yet. That's my point. They missed it. So, so a month later, February of this year, uh, there's a company that is doing the teardown of the closed reactors up in Zion, north of Chicago. These are two reactors that have been closed since 1997. Uh, very large ones. It's the largest decommissioning in the history of the United States. First two two reactors were built and torn down. And it turns out that after almost three and a half years of operating an $860 million trust fund for the teardown of these reactors, the company still had not appointed an auditor. We had called this to the attention of the Attorney General's office a year before. And we believe that the pressure of the Attorney General's office resulted in the company finally agreeing to a audit and selecting an auditor. And uh, I do have it in my pile of papers. I don't want to slow things down. They did present the audit at the last public meeting in February. Now bear in mind, $860 million fund. They had spent over $230 million of the fund on the decommissioning. The audit consisted of two pages, a cover sheet and a page of numbers. When we were asked, if we would get line item capability to kind of see what was in those categories, we were told no, but we will not be able to look at the figures. The kicker is that by law, if there's any money in that fund left over after they tear the building down, it's supposed to be returned to the rate payers. So, no auditor, billion dollar fund, who's watching the story? That's February. March 10th, a uh, different investigation comes up. Um, the Exxon Company was, uh, actually I, I flipped two of these by mistake. This, this one was, should have been actually January. Uh, Exxon had been filing incorrect reports to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission about these decommissioning funds that I just told you about. In fact, they did it a lot. And what was worse is they did it knowingly. And when they were even interviewed by the investigators from NRC, the chuckleheads from corporates at Exelon said, well, yeah, we used a different formula than yours. I mean, they didn't even try and hide it. The point is, they were lowballing the amount of money they claimed were in these funds for these teardowns. If the money is not there when it's needed to tear down the reactors, guess who gets the bill? All at once? So this is a problem, and should the NRC somehow evolve a backbone and actually fine Exelon to maximum on this, the maximum amount of fines could go into the double-digit billion dollars. It's $110,000 a day per violation per reactor. And this has been going on since 2005. Oops. Hmm. So, you know, let's face it, numbers have never been a, a really Strong point in Illinois. Just look at Springfield. Okay. What, what violation? They were supposed to do calculations on how much money was available in these decommissioning funds according to a certain formula that the agency set. And they didn't use that formula, they used their own. So they just kind of put the books, so to speak. Were they decommissioning? Not yet. But that's the point. You want to have the money there when you do. They're getting ready. And if it's not there when you're ready, you got a shortfall, you got a problem. So I'm moving along because I see it's getting a little late here. Um, the biggest one that hurt me was March 19th when four of the five nuclear regulatory commissioners, the top dogs in the agency, voted four to one to defer the installation of filter vents at the kinds of reactors that we have in Illinois that were the same design as the Fukushima reactors that exploded and melted down in Japan. I would point out that even TEPCO, the company in Japan responsible for that disaster, is starting to install these filter vents. And the filter vents are already being used in the same reactors in Europe. But our commission, in its wisdom, 
has decided that the American public doesn't deserve that protection for at least another four years because they want to study the issue a little bit more. So we have filed one of those 2.206 petitions, and it turns out that in two weeks we're going to be at a meeting with the regulators to see if they'll listen to us this time. And the Falcon would have prevented that? It would have kept a lot of radiation in the, in the reactors that we did there in Japan. It definitely would keep it in if we have a problem at Dresden, if we have a problem at the South, or if we have a problem with the Quad Cities. It wouldn't stop the problem, it would just keep it. Keep the radiation contained. inside. Correct. That's all we're asking is that little edge, you know, that little extra. Was there a lack of water? Was it part of the problem? No. Okay. Well, in this case, that, that, that would be the issue. So, let's see, we've got a few more to go. Ah, let me show you something. And this dropped on me uh, in March also. This is a report from the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Hmm. Now, this is a computer simulation uh, result. This is a simulation that was supposed to show what would be the best routes to take to move all that high-level radioactive waste if you had a repository to take it to. You know, and they, they wanted to examine this according to different variables. Population centers, length of travel, number of bridges you go over, or a variety of things. It turns out that those closed reactors I referred to earlier, the 20 commercial reactors that have no, that aren't operating, still have their waste on site. And a presidential commission has argued that that waste should be moved first. <coughs> this report suggests that Illinois is probably the best candidate to host one of these temporary high-level radioactive waste, uh, not repositories, but uh, what they call centralized interim storage facilities. They say these facilities are temporary, interim, but I think we all know what that means in federal government language. That they were supposed to have opened the permanent repository in 1997 and didn't. So our fear is that Illinois is going to have another pin in the map that I showed you earlier, which will be the nation's first de facto high-level radioactive waste uh, storage site. Oh, we're only halfway through the bad news, too. You know, I keep, I keep going on and on here. I think you get the idea, though, that perhaps these agencies are not protecting the public health and safety. That perhaps they don't necessarily just have our well-being in mind. Uh, two weeks ago, just before I left for Washington, the EPA released a, a set of draft guidelines which would change the level of contamination that would be allowed after a nuclear disaster in the United States. And it just so happens they are raising that level, just like the Japanese did after the disaster in Fukushima. The Japanese at one point decided it was perfectly acceptable for young children at age six you get the same radiation exposure as a nuclear plant worker, which is kind of goofy. But in this country, they are changing, they're suggesting guidelines of cleanup, which would change uh, the uh, amount of exposure the population would, would be exposed to, and also the calculated number of deaths and injuries that would result from that. The former system that we had called for a cleanup or, or making sure the radiation was reduced to a level that only one in 10,000 people would get a fatal cancer over a 30 year period. Under the new guidelines, that has been changed to one in 27 people would be allowed to get a fatal cancer over a 30 year period. It's a pretty drastic change in exposure from the EPA. I have uh, extra copies of something here that I I do urge you to pick up. Now, I don't know if you're pro-nuclear, neutral nuclear, if you care less about nuclear, anti-nuclear, whatever. I don't expect you to believe a single word I tell you tonight. I say this to all my audiences. Many of us have never met before. You know, I could just be another huckster just like a Commonwealth Edison or an Exelon salesperson. You gotta do your homework. So when I come out here, I'm perfectly happy and willing to say I'm biased, I am against nuclear power, that's my job, that's my mission, to end nuclear power. And people will write that off and say, oh, another no nukes kook. Okay, I can accept that. I've been going for 32 years, doesn't bother me. But when the former chairman 
of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, just laterally arabesque in a coup d'etat last year, goes public and says every reactor in this country is defective and should be closed down, I pay attention. That's exactly what Gregory Yatsko said two weeks ago. He, if you press a little further into some of his remarks here, he talks about how politics plays a role constantly at the upper echelon of the NRC, that in many cases there are times when even the staff advice that are they're given by the experts, the technical experts, are ignored by the commissioners who make the decision on political grounds. So this is not a no news coup talking. This is a guy who was the commission chair for seven years. And he's backed up by two other former NRC commissioners, Victor Delinsky and Peter Bradford. And if that wasn't enough, the decision about those filtered vents I talked to you about a moment ago, Yatsko was the only one who was pushing for the installation of those vents as soon as possible. That's why he lost his job. And the American Society of um, of uh, mechanical engineers back him up. AFSCME says he's right. So, not exactly a collection of known scoops are saying something is rotten in Denmark. So I'll leave these for people to, to take and look at it. But there were, there were hearings last year, uh, and again, I forget it before we were body, that were held by some of the in which the four commissioners, uh, the other four commissioners were saying, no, I'm not. And I watched almost the whole thing. It was one of those grueling exercises in glory, trivia, that you can imagine. But what came out at the hearings was that these people were basically had been caught by industry and were ganging up on Yasko for, uh, for uh, staff harassment. Yeah, uh, yeah for, for basically issues that had nothing to do with the safety. Exactly. You know, being mean. Yeah, it is mean. So the current commissioner, just so happens, is a geologist. Her name is uh, Allison McFarland, and she worked at a place called Yakima, which we'll get to in a moment here. And uh, I've met her several times. I've seen her present papers at Lake Forest College and elsewhere. She's a credible scientist, very bright, served on the Presidential Commission on Radioactive Waste, and is now the chairwoman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. I had a reporter ask me, because she was going to have an exclusive interview with, with Allison, if you had a question you wanted to ask her, Dave, what would it be? And my response was, Commissioner McFarland, how are you going to protect your bat when you try and push for safety against the other four commissioners who were perfectly happy to knife Ray Gutsko? She didn't ask that question. So let's move on to radioactive waste, another fun issue. There are different classes of waste. The most uh, worrisome, the most concerning, the stuff that most people are talking about the most is the spent fuel. It, spent is actually a bad word, it's not a technical word. It is irradiated fuel that can no longer serve a useful function in the reactor and has to be taken out. And we have no place to put it. The strange thing is that the nuclear alchemy process that goes on, the nuclear physics taking place in the reactors, literally, transforms uranium into dozens, if not scores, of other kinds of elements that are all radioactive. Some of them have very short lifespans, in seconds, in microseconds in some cases. Others have incredibly long lifespans in the billions of years. So it's, you went from pretty much uranium, which you knew and was predictable, to a soup of dozens, over 100 kinds of radioisotopes <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me, of varying lengths and varying hazards. Two main kinds are fission products, which are pieces that are split up of uranium that got broken apart, and others are heavier elements than uranium that absorb neutrons and become what are called transuranic elements. That's one of the waste forms up here. So that spent fuel has no place to go. It's sitting at the reactor sites, and you really do need to keep it out of the environment for centuries. The licensing periods they talk about are just arbitrary. 10,000 years is what people are looking at now. In, in Europe, they're even looking at 100,000 years to care for this waste, keep it out of the environment. So we have quite a complicated problem here. 
We have the stuff at the reactor sites. We've got to figure out a way to get it to some magic hole in the ground somewhere that it'll keep it out of the environment for up to 100,000 years. That's the problem we face. That's what happens when you don't build the bathroom first. There are other kinds of categories. In the United States, we only use low level, which is pretty much everything that's not spent fuel. And then we have a few others. And the mill tailings from your mining, the uranium is one of them. And then there are two other uh, categories, NARM and NORM, which are kind of research related in some cases. It's naturally occurring radioactive materials or nuclear accelerator radioactive materials. And those are, again, pretty much academic and research uh, wastes, and they don't actually constitute a large amount of the problem. This is more than 17 oh, yeah. times the CZ-137 release for me. Why don't shut this guy up? I cannibalized the slide, and unfortunately, I don't know how to take out the audio portion of this. This is a, a picture of what is called a spent fuel pool. Every reactor has to have one. It's a glorified swimming pool, 40 feet deep, and it contains the hottest waste as it comes out of the reactor which has to stay underwater for at least five to 10 years before you can move it anywhere. Otherwise, you expose your workers to a dangerous mm -hmm. levels of radiation. So these swimming pools are at all the reactors. And this is currently what we're worried about at Fukushima in Japan, because while the reactors supposedly are in cold shutdown, they still have several thousand tons of this stuff sitting in a glorified swimming pool, mm -hmm. five stories in the air, in buildings that have been damaged by one of the worst earthquakes in history. Where? Japan. Oh, Fukushima. And our four Illinois reactors that are the same design have the same problem. Swimming pool, five stories in the air. If the building gets shaken, hit by an airplane, whatever, you could have a problem at the swimming pool. And swimming pools above ground are unique in their hazard because if you break the pipes that feed cooling water in or circulating water out, the pool will drain. And when that happens, the heat that's left over in the fuel builds up, mm -hmm. melts down, catches fire, and gives you a worse headache than if the reactor had gone critical. That's why it's important to understand the disaster in Japan is not over. It will not be over until those spent fuel pools have all of their material taken out and put in a safer, safer place. So spent fuel is a real problem. When you take it out of the, the wet pool, the swimming pool, after about five or 10 years, you can transfer it to a different kind of container. It's called dry cast. This is a schematic diagram. It's merely a concrete cylinder, 14, 16 feet tall, 12 feet across. You put the fuel in the center, there's a basket in there that holds it, and then you seal it up, and you wait for the magic hole in the ground. That's all we can do. But it's better than leaving it in the pool bad as this is. We still have problems with it, though, because the way the industry does it looks like this. If you fly over some of these reactor sites, you see these white canisters in nice little rows and nice square concrete pads. We refer to this as the bowling alley method of storage of radioactive waste. All you need is a big enough bowling ball, and you've got a crisis. So what we are recommending is, all right, use these dry casts, but don't put them next to each other. That's kind of silly. We want something a little bit more hardened and a little bit more dispersed. So we have helped, for the last 10 years, develop a program called Hardened On-Site Storage, which uses the same canisters, but moves them farther apart from each other and burns up soil around um, the sides of the uh, canisters so that you remove at least the line of sight capability of terrorists or errant airliners from crashing into a whole bunch of malls. You might do damage to one, maybe two, but you're not going to take out Detroit or Chicago. That's the good news. So we are recommending this kind of program, and we're getting a lot of pushback from the nuclear industry because it's twice as expensive as if you would just use canisters. How about the silos of decommissioned missiles? I don't know. <laughs> you got to get it there. Now, some of you may have heard of a place called Yucca Mountain, Nevada. We have been uh, looking at a hole in the ground there since the mid-90s. And because of politics, it became the only hole in the ground that we were looking at until it was determined that there were some serious geological flaws here in Yakima. And who made one of those determinations? 
but the current chairwoman of the NRC herself. At Lake Forest College in uh, 2006, she reported that Yakima indeed failed two international standards, two of the four basic standards for the safe disposal of high-level radioactive waste. Yet, you will still hear this year Congress people, especially from Illinois, John Shimkus being one of them, who are championing that we open up a mountain and use it to dispose of radioactive waste. And New Mexico says NIMBY, not in my backyard. New Mexico has WIP, which is uh, weapon ball material waste. So, cost us $9 billion to figure out that this hole in the ground won't work. So, what do we do? The president commissioned a group of people about three years ago Blue Ribbon Commission on America's Integrated Future. They worked for two years and made some recommendations, and now those recommendations are about to become proposed legislation. We're supposed to see a draft of that legislation later this month. And uh, what they are recommending, again, is that orphaned waste, the waste at the sites that are closed now, be the first to be moved to these centralized interim storage facilities that I mentioned earlier. And as I said, Illinois seems to be very close to the top of a very short list for the first centralized interior repository. We disagree with this uh, proposal. We don't think it's necessary to move the waste because you can manage it on site going at zero miles per hour much better than you can manage it on train tracks and highways and bridges and barges going 30, 40, and 50 miles an hour. And the point is, even if you store it at a centralized location, you're going to have to move it a second time later when you get the permanent site set up somewhere around the year 2040. So our position is, why move it twice? For 30 years, the industry and the government has been assuring us, it's safe where it is, it's safe where it is, it's safe where it is. Okay, we believe you, leave it there. That's our position. But when you leave it there, put it in hardened on-site storage. And then do your homework to get a credible, geological, permanent repository. Is there such a thing? We'll find out. So I read you the quotes of I won't read it anymore. Trust me, it's in that report I held up. A little sentence in there that kind of singles out of my Now, some of you may have heard the term reprocessing, because if we don't bury the stuff, is there anything else we could possibly do to it? And the industry says, oh yes, let's recycle it. So they like to use the word recycle. Because who could possibly be against recycling, right? It's Earth Day. Yet, the real term for what they propose is called reprocessing. And when you look at the devil in the details of what reprocessing means, you find that it's a lot different than what the industry tries to sell you. They are saying this is a magical way of dealing with the waste problem that we have, reducing the inventory of these very long-lived radioisotopes from the waste, and maybe even reclaiming useful materials to make new fuel, like you're supposed to do with recycling, right? Okay, on paper again, sounds great, platonic form is wonderful, let's see what the reality is. Who reprocesses on, in the world now? Well, very few nations do that. Russia does it, France does it, England sort of does it, they're looking to get out of it, and nobody else. And there are reasons for that. In reprocessing, what you do, unlike crushing aluminum cans, putting them in a bag, taking them to get money back, is you 